Our subject tonight is God, sex, and abortion. I'll begin with God. In a previous clip, I talked about what it means, what the word God means. And I concluded that it's an emotional term. It's as if a young child says, my daddy's the best daddy in the whole world. They're speaking emotionally. They're telling you how they feel. They aren't claiming necessarily that their father is better than yours or mine or anyone else's. Just telling you how they feel. And it occurred to me that when people say God is love, what they're saying is, I think, they're looking in the universe. They're saying, what do I experience in my life? And they decide that of all the things they experience, that of all the things they know, love is supreme. And so they say God is love. Now, an interesting thing about this is that in our theology, we have four ways of looking at God, or four aspects. God can be personal or impersonal, and God can be transcendent or imminent. So a transcendent personal God is like God the Father who was outside the universe, made the universe, but was in heaven. Now, when the idea of God is love is, first of all, that's imminent. Love we can experience. Love exists in the universe. And it's impersonal. People love each other, but love itself is not a person. And to take this one step further, if the word God expresses, if we use it to refer to what we consider supreme above all else, then if a person feels that in sexual intercourse to have supreme physical pleasure or supreme emotional closeness, oneness, they may naturally say, and they do say, oh God. But of course, that's not the same as a God who is a person who, you know, looks down on us from heaven, of course. Now, people who have a personal transcendent God they might have allegiance to a hierarchy, to a, to a religious leader, but they don't consider that hierarchy or religious organization God itself. They just consider it kind of like a messenger from God. So such people, for instance, the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven. So God is the Father who is outside the universe, but maybe some pe person feels very feels that the church or the pope or some religious leader is God's instrument in the world. So they, their, their God is not imminent. Let's move on to sex. Now, by the way, this is kind of conjecture. I'm not saying this is true, what I'm going to say, but it might be. It's something to think about. So let's suppose someone has a personal God, a God who is a person. Now, the advantage of that is they can feel maybe closer, they can relate more to that God than someone who has an impersonal God. But if God is a person, he sees us all the time, right? And if he sees us all the time, you know, maybe this engenders a kind of restrictive attitude towards sex. I mean, if he's watching us, should we do this? Should we do that? Isn't that embarrassing? Now, of course, we can do this if it leads to children because God wants the world to go on. He wants new children to be born. So I guess we can do this. But all that other stuff, maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe it's wrong. And so in Christianity, at times, the highest, the most respected person was the monk who gave up sex entirely. And uh, Jesus himself recommended that. And a lot of religions have a very restrict, restrictive attitude towards sex. And I wonder if some of that stems, subconsciously perhaps, from the idea that God is a person and God is watching us, and so we better not do this and this and this. In contrast, and this I don't know if this is true, maybe people who believe in an impersonal God maybe have more freer sex lives because they don't, you know, if you believe you're a speck living on a speck uh, in a speck you know like if you could take the vastness of the universe and its age in, in consideration and you feel that god is if, if you feel 
that God has made this whole Yumbanga so huge universe, then maybe he's not paying attention to what you're doing in the bedroom. Possibly. Now, if this is true, I would expect it to be disguised. In other words, if there was a, a discussion about what is sexually permiss uh, permissible, I wouldn't expect someone to say, well, I feel that God is watching me, so I don't want to do this, this, and this. I would expect that, that their views to be clothed in very philosophical, elevated language. So that's what I would expect, but maybe part of it at least comes down to God is watching me, therefore, well, I don't want to do that. So there might be hidden motives in discussions. There might be things that are unacknowledged. And I feel that when we get to abortion, that that is probably true. And the reason is the two labels that are used for the two sides really aren't descriptive. So I feel something else is going on. So for instance, pro-choice. Okay, uh, this is fine. This is what pro-choice is. I think it describes it well. But if you respect the English language, you wouldn't call yourself pro-choice and say a woman's body is her own unless you believed she could sell it for sexual purposes. In other words, unless you believed in prostitution. And I said sell it, I meant rent it. But even sell it. Sell her, her kidney if for you know, $10,000 if she wanted to. I'm not saying that these things are good or bad necessarily. I'm saying if you respect what the English word means, pro-choice, I would expect someone to be for those two things. But pro-choice people in general are not, in my experience. And then we get to pro-life. I think this is accurate, opposing abortion and euthanasia. But if you think about the word life, shouldn't someone who's pro-life be vegetarian, not kill animals to live, or at least Shouldn't they be against capital punishment? I mean, it's been proven. People have been on death row, and then something like DNA has exonerated them with 100% certainty. So we can be pretty sure that capital punishment sometimes kills innocent people. If you're pro-life, shouldn't you be against it? Shouldn't you be against war and be a pacifist? If you're pro-life? If you're so worried about children, shouldn't you... Uh, try to empty the orphanages? Shouldn't pro-life people be adopting children, giving them a home? I, I think that pro-life and pro-choice are kind of posing. I don't think people are really saying what they believe. I, th I think they're, the, the labels are uh, as a, a, affecting an attitude. I'd say pro-choice, this is my bias now, I'd say pro-choice is closer. They do believe in choice in the sense that uh, sometimes a, a woman has all the children she can handle. Maybe she's a single mother, maybe she works at a low-paying job, she just can't afford to be in the hospital. Maybe she doesn't have good health coverage. In the United States, health coverage isn't as good as some other countries. And this is maybe one of the countries where the the pro-life movement is strongest, but it would be good if they would provide for children, if, 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 they'd, if the pro-life people would support more government programs to help, you know, uh, better medical care, if they would uh, volunteer to adopt children that a woman can't handle. So I think that's all I had to say tonight. I've put out some ideas. I don't know how solid these ideas are, but I'm putting them out for your consideration. So thank you.